Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kellen here from Start Your Systems, and welcome back to Monster Energy Supercross 4, the official video game where today we're going to be playing a custom replica version of the 2022 Anaheim 2 Supercross in this game and talking about the real life Anaheim 2 Supercross that just happened over the weekend in Angel Stadium, round four of the Monster Energy AMA Supercross Championship. I was there again, as usual. Uh, covering the races for racetracksonline.com. So if you guys want to check out some more coverage of things that I did over there, um, be sure to check it out. Uh, I've been doing the weed show. Some of you guys have seen the weed show before, but I've been doing that the last couple of weeks. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, kind of, I guess, just more of my direct right after the main event thoughts as you can find over at racetracksonline.com. Uh, but yeah, a day later, after the race has been completed, now I'm uh, going to share a little bit of my thoughts about the race over the weekend here on Start Your Systems. Uh, first of all, I wanted to talk about this track, which is on the PC. It is called Anaheim 2 2022. If you guys want to try it, um, you can, I think, search my name, which is just Kellen, K-E-L-L-E-N, on Steam. And uh, should be able to come up with the track. If not, you can search it by Anaheim 2 2002, uh, 22 uh, with the search. And you'll be able to find this track. Haven't built it on Xbox One. Haven't built it on PS4. So I apologize uh, to the console players. But uh, just to talk about building this track real quick. Obviously, there's not really a raised corner to use uh, in the corner that I just went through. That you had a raised corner in real life. And there is a raised outside corner that you could use. That's a 180 outside raised corner. Uh, but it doesn't really mimic what that corner was doing uh, in real life. Because then I could just tuck to the inside and completely avoid you know going to the very top of the berm essentially so i just left it flat it looks a little bit dumb but the rest of the track i feel like i did a pretty good job putting everything together it's kind of wall jump over the table then you three and then it's kind of a tricky three over a bit of a steeper single and then a little floater three into this corner uh in real life a lot of these guys are checking up doubling in right here then three right here and three again but honestly i think it's easier in this game to do the three in three middle double out Supercross triple into the sand section, which is going to be probably the main talking point of this video, it seems like. Uh, in and out of the sand, back across the start straight, and pretty much that's kind of how I built the track. It seems to flow pretty good. There's a lot of different, you know, lines to choose. It's a bit too big. I wish I could have, you know, maybe scaled it down a little bit more, but I just feel like it has a better flow when I open up the scaling just a little bit, uh, add a little bit more, uh, you know, space between the transitions and stuff like that. So... It's kind of just my thought process on building the track. Hopefully you guys kind of enjoyed a little bit of that discussion at the beginning. I don't normally do that, but let's talk about this race. Again, spoiler alert, if you haven't already watched, watched the race, uh, I'll be spoiling it right about now. So big winner, round four of Monster Energy Supercross. There's a reason why I'm using a Star Racing Yamaha replica bike right now. Eli Tomac jumps teams, goes to this new program, leading the points earlier than he's ever led the points in Monster Energy Supercross. And wouldn't you know it, he's already got a win under his belt as well. So he wins Anaheim 2. And it was kind of weird. I felt like him winning this race was a little bit, um, you know, kind of like vindication, if you will, of where his progress level has been at. Because it wasn't like a stereotypical Eli Tomac dominating the whole field type of ride. It was a lot more of like a letting the race kind of fall into his lap kind of ride. And when the opportunity landed there, he took it um, and, and he didn't pull a huge gap. He didn't destroy the field. He didn't, you know, charge from way back to get it. He just got a decent start, let the kind of, you know, couple of things that happened in front of him happen, took advantage of a mistake from Jason Anderson when he was in the lead, got the lead and then kind of managed the gap from there and went on to win the race. It was almost like a very non Eli Tomac kind of main event victory uh, in that regard. And he's won a lot of these races, so it's kind of weird to say that, but it, it just felt like, you know, a perfectly managed kind of level-headed race out of Tomac. And uh, I think that that is maybe the thing that I'm kind of most worried about for the rest of the field is that, you know, if Eli Tomac went out this weekend and dominated and, and you know, started in second, got in the lead early, and then won by 15 seconds, I would be like, that's great, but... You know, is this going to happen every weekend? Are we going to start seeing, you know, demise and uplift and other things like that? For him to be able to realize in the last couple of weeks, and I talked to him about this on Friday, like he's, you know, he realizes his starts need to come around and that's his one problem area. But he also realizes that he needs to kind of, you know, take it in stride, if you will, and not, you know, force things and, and try to make stuff happen when it doesn't need to. Like he just needs to get through these first couple rounds, get the ball rolling. 
And in the past, you know, that, that process has worked for him on occasion, but it also hasn't. He's also been too far behind. Uh, if you go back to like 2017, he was too far behind really Ryan Dungey. Caught him, but then one t tiny mistake kind of ruins everything. So I think this is a very good Eli Tomac for where he's at right now. I think that's kind of scary for the rest of the field. And uh, yeah, goes 6-4-2-1 in the first four rounds. Now has a six point championship lead. And uh, earliest he's led the championship, I, I don't know. Like, I, I still don't necessarily think I'm going to switch over yet and say that I'm picking up for the championship because I still feel like I need to see, you know, like, f to move over to this new bike, another thing that is going to be a hurdle for him, and some people will say it's not going to be, but I do think it's actually going to happen. When we go east, despite these guys training in Florida, he's probably going to go through some setup issues that he you know would have already had iron out at kawasaki like he would have went into minneapolis he would have went into dallas which i guess are two more hard packed tracks but then once we get to daytona and we go to atlanta motor speedway and, and st louis and some of these other tracks that are softer dirt and and really just kind of get rutted and gnarly and uh the whoops will break down majorly so i think he'll struggle a little bit more with setup than maybe you people watching at home believe uh that's just my personal opinion i could be wrong but knowing how eli tomac has gone through setups in the past with with kawasaki and seemingly never feeling 100 percent comfortable on any setup and then he would find one or two magical recipes every now and again but i don't know i just i, I have a hunch that we're going to get to the midpoint of the season and he's going to be tinkering a little bit with the bike and that's going to be the real detriment for him uh in the championship fight when everybody else is starting to actually figure it out um i think that's where he'll fall a little bit but i don't necessarily think that means that he's not going to win the title or he's out of the championship contention i just think that that's going to be one of the hurdles he'll have to jump through aside from that everything else looks like it's coming together uh his starts are starting to look at least decent enough to put him in a good position in the main event um you know this weekend i think he was second or third in the heat race and then got in a second right away and then in the main event sixth i think is where he actually went through the first corner but made some good quick passes and was into fourth so he's he's kind of doing it all right you know like he's just figured out these little things that he needs to fix in these first couple of weeks made those adjustments and and now he's won a race uh and extended a championship lead this early in the championship as well so Kudos to him. Uh, I don't really feel like I have much more to talk about with Eli Tomac because it's kind of where I'm at with him. What I really feel like I need to talk about because everybody's going to talk about it all week long is Jason Anderson on Ken Roxon. Well, first of all, Jason Anderson, uh, like I said last week, I would have put him first in my power rankings coming into the evening. I still actually think I would put him first in my power rankings leaving Anaheim despite him leading the main event, making a mistake, and then ending up finishing second behind Tomac. I still think... Ando's just actually been the best guy through four rounds in terms of speed. But, uh, you know, he's had the couple issues come up with the bike, uh, you know, getting into Justin Barsha at the first round. And now, as he comes up to pass or try to pass Ken Roxon for the lead of the race in Anaheim this weekend, boy, oh boy, I thought the contact was a little much. Uh, watching it live, I was like, dang, that's wow. And then uh, watching it back, I maybe, you know, walked it back a little bit, but I was still like, wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could see where Anderson was thinking it was going to happen. He missed kind of the rut that everybody was taking in terms of like the inside rut in the sand. So he had already hopped over it. Like his future was decided at that point. Like he was going into Roxon's line. And uh, you could see in his mind, he chose to make the pass attempt at that point in time. Uh, for Roxon, yeah, I guess there's going to be some people that will come in and say Roxon should have backed out of the challenge. But also... It's pretty early in the race there. It's like lap six, I think, that they got together. You just don't expect that early in the race to have that level of contact. Um, and people all the time come at me and say, it doesn't matter what time of the race, you should always you know, expect stuff like that. But I think timing matters, especially with this current crop of, of you know, top level talent. You go back to the 80s or 90s or whatever, I think timing didn't matter. I think you could have gotten your doors blown off at the beginning of the race and, and they would just be like, yeah, that's racing. Nowadays, I feel like these guys are so much more about like putting a full main, main event together in terms of a strategy, in a sense. Uh, so they almost have it like planned out when they're going to take, you know, some laps to kind of regroup or uh, take some laps to just get 
back going to a certain speed or something like that and then they'll wake it back up to a high heart rate high intensity kind of thing so when they're playing that game a little bit and it's not just intensity 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 i think that early in the race to come down the inside and, and try to make that pass i just don't necessarily think that anybody on the track would assume that anderson was going to try to make that pass uh the way that he did i think that roxon probably would have thought if anything anderson gets a good drive hooks that inside rut in the sand and pulls up alongside of him in the next corner he doesn't think anderson's going to miss that inside rut but not decide to back out of the challenge and just go underneath ken roxon's two tires essentially so um that is why i think in my personal opinion anderson's move was a little bit eh? and uh I would be totally fine to walk that back, except the fact that Anderson in the post-race press conference and right after the main event when he was asked about it, basically said, like, yeah, that's my bad. I didn't really want to ride like that. So um, I'm not trying to pick on Ando. I'm not saying, like, uh, he's a, you know, an idiot or whatever. Uh, I, I think that he knows that the move was maybe a little bit much. Uh, maybe just, you know, take it a little bit easier, try to make the pass later. Anderson caught Kenny pretty quickly. And I could see that there'd be some urgency involved with Eli Tomac coming behind that Anderson would want to get away. But I think at that point in time, Anderson was going to pull away from Tomac anyway. And probably the contact maybe just took him out of his element just a little bit. But uh, yeah, I just, it's one of those situations that I, I chalk it more up to racing than anything. But if I have to say one thing, timing wise, that, that was a little bit aggressive for me that early in the race so the the sucky part about it is it kind of may have ruined ken roxon's like championship hopes honestly uh it's no secret that roxon is better early in the championships uh he always starts strong and kind of fades even his outdoor seasons were like that and and yes he had 20 perfect motos uh in a 24 moto span in 2016 which was kind of the most anti roxon season i think i've ever seen but even so, like he wasn't dominating motos as much as he was early in the season as he did late in the season. So, uh, you know, he always has a bit of a dip. It happened in his 2014 450 title run. Uh, it happens pretty much every Supercross season. He'll win a one or a myriad of the first six races. He won three Indies last year, uh, which are rounds four, five, and six, and then hit a lull. So for Roxon, I feel like you need to get to Daytona with the points lead. Honestly speaking, because anything after that, it's kind of like, a, is it going to be something that he can hold on to? And again, I'm not trying to pick on Kenny here. It's just kind of the track record, record that shows at this point. Like he definitely does uh, struggle a little bit with whatever it is in the second half. A lot of times it's been health issues. So there's definitely a valid argument to say that if he doesn't have those health issues in the second half, he's probably a lot better. But even so, you know, like 2014, Ken Ruxin's not dealing with health issues but still struggled in the second half of the outdoors. He won the title as a rookie, so I, I get it. It's a little bit different. Um, but it, but it's, it's kind of been a thing that's happened with Kenny over the years. So for him to finish 13th, it was uh, his second 13th place finish on the season, going back to Oakland, also got a 13th there. And now Roxon is 23 points down of Eli Tomac. He's 11 points down of Cooper Webb. He's you know, a lot of points down at Chase Sexton and Jason Anderson as well, who I now believe are title contenders as well. He has a huge road to climb in front of him, and I feel like he's going to need kind of a little bit of luck to make it you know, flip around for him. So my point being with all this is that it sucks that that one instance uh, you know, between him and Anderson probably makes Roxon's title chances go down quite a lot. Uh, is he going to just be completely out of this championship fight? No, I don't think so. I think he's probably, I could see him easily winning Glendale, the Triple Crown. Wouldn't be surprised at all. Having a great night, maybe even winning all three main events. He's a great starter, uh, shorter races. Uh, I just, you know, it seems like something that would work for him. And then suddenly, you know, let's say Tomac gets a fourth in Glendale and then Roxon gains seven points back on Tomac right there. I could see something like that happen for sure, but it still isn't going to be like a huge dent necessarily when you think about the grand picture of it. Going from 23 points down to 15 points and having a dominant ride is not as big of a deal as if Roxton had, you know, ended up in fourth in that main event because he was probably going to get passed by Jason and at least Eli and probably Chase as well. But if he finishes fourth in that main event and Eli wins, he only loses seven points right there. So he's only 14 down of Eli. 
heading into Glendale. If he wins this weekend, suddenly he's only seven down. You know, if Tomac gets fourth, it, it, it just, it's one of those things that, gosh, it sucks because it really put a huge dent. You can't have two thirteenths uh, this early in the season and expect to like recover unless you're just going to click off a ton of wins in a row, which he can, but we'll see if it happens. Um, I don't know if he officially went to Copenhagen. I really don't. Uh, we never really got any official word from him or the team, whether that was reality. They said it was real. He said it was real. So, I, I mean, we're taking it for what it's worth, but um, that seems so weird that he would leave the country, even if it is for some, you know, medical assistance for something that, you know, in the midweek between a championship. But uh, I, I really don't know. We don't know the full story there. Um, yeah, moving on, though, like I said, I would put Jason Anderson probably top my power ranking still. He's eight points out of the championship lead now and third in the championship, two points behind Chase Sexton. Like I said, eight points behind Eli Tomac. Gosh, he's been so good. Uh, the one thing that's going to really start to kill him now is I'm pretty sure he's going to be watched a little bit harder by the AMA. He was in the AMA truck a long time after the main event. And uh, we thought that the results hadn't become official uh, from the main event because they were either going to look at Cooper Webb down the whoop section, not getting penalized, or uh, Malcolm Stewart cut quite a bit of the track when he got the whoops wrong one lap. But I guess they deemed that neither situation was gained an advantage. And instead, they were actually talking to Anderson a lot, I guess, about aggressive riding. I don't think he's going on probation like Justin Barsha did. But I do know that, you know, they were not necessarily stoked with some of the contact that he made in San Diego. Can't imagine that uh, the AMA is going to look too fondly on the, the Roxon situation this week. Wouldn't put it past Honda having a little word with the AMA about that either. So that's one thing that's going to, you know, kind of affect Anderson negatively moving forward is that he might have to, you know, maybe ride with a little less of a chip on his shoulder, I guess. But uh, I don't even think he's got a chip on his shoulder. I think the, the Roxon contact at round three was more or less Roxon just didn't even know he was there. And uh, Anderson was just in the inside line and they just made contact and it was swing arm to, you know, forks. It wasn't even that aggressive of a pass. So. I wouldn't put that on my list of things that Anderson should be on probation for or anything like that. Not saying he is, just saying I wouldn't, you know, add that to his tally. This week, I would say, uh, you got to look at it a little bit, but it is, it is kind of one incident that he's had so far this year. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's one of those things that you're going to say it will repeat, though Anderson does have a little bit of a, a history with this. Regardless of which, um, yeah, he's, he's been involved now in a little bit of controversy. He's had some issues to start the season with his, you know, bike. Uh, he's gotten taken out by Justin Barsha. Now he's taken out Ken Roxon. It's not necessarily been the smoothest start to the year, despite everything looking like, you know, speed wise, it's kind of clicking for him. So, um, yeah, kind of interesting story with Anderson right now. And then uh, talking about Chase Sexton finishing third, just a solid third, kind of took a very similar uh, approach that Eli Tomac took in this main event, just let everything kind of fall into his lap a little bit. At one point, it looked like he was going to maybe make a charge up to those guys, but it just kind of stifled. Then he almost went over the bars on the wall jump into the rhythm section, so that was a close one. Um, but yeah, overall, I just feel like if that's the section we're going to get every week, if the section that we saw at San Diego is going to happen every once in a while, He's definitely going to be in this title hunt. Um, he looks too good, too fluid, and in control. Uh, some of the bike changes that he made in the past couple of weeks have helped a ton with consistency. He hasn't really looked that off really anywhere. He hasn't really put a foot wrong much of anywhere in the last couple of weeks. So, um, yeah, I think he's going to be right in this thing. The flip side of that, of course, is Cooper Webb, which a lot of people have been talking about in the last 24 hours as well because he tipped over while battling with Justin Barsha for seventh and then got up on the track um, and then rode 20 feet and, and then turned right and decided to skip the whoops. Now, he didn't accelerate past the whoops, which is always the, you know, the big no-no from the AMA. You can't do that. That's why Barsha got uh, docked a position for, uh, in San Diego. But anyway, you know, Webb tipped over right here, rode to here, and then turned right, jumped off the whoops, and then, you know, rode down the, the whoops like this. He looked back, made sure that he was not going to jump on right in front of anybody. He did actually kind of jump back on the track right in front of Dean Wilson. Uh, some people say that he gained too much of an advantage by being off the track. I, I don't know. Like, to me, it's one of those things that, like, yes, he probably should have stayed on the track. But he did make a, you know, very concerted effort to slow down, look back. Um, he 
probably should have lost a position to Wilson, but I don't know. Like, are we really going to be this kind of nitpicky, I guess? Uh, the Barsha thing is ridiculous because it's a safety issue. You can't go full speed down the side of any part of the track, especially the outside edges of the track. Like, if, if Barsha were to do that uh, alongside of a rhythm lane and he's clicking through gears wide open, that outside edge doesn't have dirt on it. It has, like, loose gravel um, and then plywood and some plaster paper and stuff like that occasionally. So more often than not, Barsha gets on the gas like that outside of the track, and then the second he gets on the front brake, the front tire goes whoop out from underneath of him, and his bike's sliding along at 40 miles an hour through a sea of track workers and, uh, you know, photographers and other things like that down there. So you just can't do that. You can't be that high speed off the side of the track that's why it's a penalty it's a safety issue this week i guess yes you could talk about advantage versus disadvantage i don't think what webb did next to the pits was a safety issue he uh you know slowed down enough to show that he was slowing down he wasn't clicking through gears he looked back to make sure he rejoined the track safely he should have stayed in the whoops he shouldn't have gone off the track i agree but again, it's so tough to say like, yes, 100% he deserves a penalty because of X, Y, and Z. Like, go through the whoops next time, I guess, Cooper. But, you know, this time out, it was just probably a little bit of a mental lapse. He just was trying to fix his goggles or whatever after picking it up, went off the track. I don't know. It, it's a weird circumstance. I, I, I definitely understand where people are coming from saying he deserves a penalty. But also, he, he wasn't clicking gears. So, I don't know. It is what it is. Um, yeah, 450 class, so catch the fever. It's been kind of crazy. And uh, I don't know what the heck is going to happen next, but I'll tell you what, Eli Tomac and Jason Anderson looking pretty darn good. We might see Tomac, Anderson, Sexton break away a little bit here for the next couple of weeks because it doesn't look like Webb's going to get it figured out. His bike is not looking good in the whoops, nor his Plessingers, nor his Moosegans. And uh, we're going to Glendale where the whoops are going to be solid as concrete. And they're not going to break down for those guys to jump through it. They have to blitz them. And as long as they stay pretty well not cupped out, I think they'll be okay. But they get cupped out even a little bit. Those boys are struggling again this week. Uh, update on Plessinger, by the way. He's okay. Uh, kind of knocked his head a little bit. But he said that no concussion. He just had a little bit of bruising. I think he had like a, uh, some bruising in his shoulder. And uh, just said that it, it wasn't comfortable to finish the race. So... Didn't uh, finish in Anaheim, too, but said he'll be back for Glendale. So that's a little bit update on AP. And, uh, yeah, so let's move on to the 250 class. Get through this kind of quickly because I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But in the 250 class, Michael Moseman, Christian Craig, battle royale out front. Good battle, too. I thought it was really interesting kind of game of cat and mouse where it seemed like they each had their spots, but nobody really had, uh, you know, one specific spot that they felt like they would... They could, like, I guess, make the pass stick for Craig or, in Moseman's case, pull away consistently enough. Uh, Moseman kind of said that he felt after the race that his strengths were pushing through uh, jumps in the rhythm lanes, and that was what was allowing him to get a little bit of a gap working on Craig. But obviously, Craig was going a little bit faster in the whoops and probably a tiny bit faster in, like, the turns. Uh, so it just was an accordion effect. Mosman had the lead for a little bit. Craig just slowly closed up, and then they were on each other's tail for five, six laps straight before Craig finally made a pass. Mosman went right back up the inside in the next corner. I thought he got him back, but Craig was able to skirt back by around the outside. And then the you know two corners later, Craig just has a better drive in the whoops, and that was kind of it in terms of establishing enough of a gap that Moseman didn't have a spot to jump, like come back up the inside and show him a wheel. Craig kind of was able to maintain that gap for the rest of the distance, finished with about a three-second lead in the end of it, and picks up his third win from four tries on the season, extends his championship lead out now to 11 points on Hunter Lawrence, who got third. We'll talk about him in a minute. And Moseman now 14 back of Craig in third uh, in the championship. So, yeah, Craig, I'll tell you what. I was there on press day when he had his crash, and I I saw the very tail end of it and it, the tail end of it looked like his bike literally was a missile into the nets. So I just turned my head at the last second to see his bike go flying into the nets and him kind of ragged all over the back of the berm. I didn't, you know, at the, initially I didn't see how he got there. Um, and then Tomac came off the, cr off the track, went over and uh, was kind of standing there and Tomac was telling his mechanics that side of the story. And he said, yeah, he was just nose high panic revved 
and then off the back of the bike and then straight over. And then I w walked over and talked with Lewis Phillips of MX Vice, asked if he saw it. And he goes, oh, yeah, we got footage of it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, please show me. I want to see it. And, uh, yeah, they, they got tremendous footage of it. Sean Ogden over there, former sim player. Uh, you race for the uh, British Motocross of Nations in sim team in 2014. Now he's a videographer over there at MX Vice, and he happened to catch Christian Craig's crash, and whoo, was it burly. It was burly, though, because his bike made it look a lot worse than it really was. Like, Craig kind of just flipped over the back of the berm and landed on his feet and said he didn't even have a scratch on him. So that was, you know, that was good. But his bike, like I said, it was a freaking missile going into those nets and uh, took a couple poles down and whew, lucky, I would say, in the end of it all. But, uh, yeah, Craig rode off with his mechanic, came back in, and then I asked him when he came back into the stadium if he was okay. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm all good. And then he said, Mathis saved me because Steve Mathis, we always uh, say, Steve Mathis came up with the idea of the Nets. But I guess Kevin Woodham actually came up with the idea of the Nets. Does it really matter? The point is we have the Nets now. They've saved countless guys from really going, you know, flying over berms. Logan Carnow last year almost killed a bunch of guys lining up on the gate on the opposite side of a berm when he went over one. Uh, everybody remembers Blake Baggett spider manning onto it in Tampa in 18, I think it was, or 19. Um, yeah, just crazy, crazy overall. But, uh, yeah, so has that crash on Friday and uh, pretty much immediately wiped it from his memory. It seemed like he had just like the very straight-up typical Craig day on Saturday. It was fastest in free practice. Um, had got out front in free practice and pulled away a little bit. Then in the second qual or in the second session, which was the first qualifying session, he purposely let everybody go so he could have free track in the back and then just put hot laps down back there. Moseman actually outdid him though in qualifying in uh, Q1, and then Craig was able to fight back and you know get him right back in Q2. But um, very typical day for Craig. And then start in the main event was about where he's been starting this whole time. So the only difference was that he didn't have to pass like Freezy and, uh, you know, these other guys. He Well, he did pass Freezy, but I'm saying he didn't have to pass uh, the guys that he isn't challenging for the championship more or less this time. He actually did have to pass Moseman, and uh, I thought he played it very well. Like, he just sat in there behind Michael, waited for um, his opportunity to pounce, pounced, and got the lead and took away with it. So, yeah, Craig's looking solid, and if he can literally throw his bike at 40 miles an hour into the nets on friday and win on saturday i don't know what's going to stop him right now but uh we'll see triple crowns are a little bit weird those guys don't necessarily love them but uh craig did get his first career supercross win in glendale back in 2016 so good vibes there maybe he's going to feel good about going back to that stadium uh for Moseman, he gets second on the night probably had a chance at winning but he just couldn't quite get close enough in the end to get back around craig and then uh, third place behind them, boy, oh, boy, did stuff kick off back there. That was crazy. Uh, Vince Freezy ran third forever. He was borderline maybe going to get a podium out of that. Then crashes in these whoops with three to go or two to go. And uh, Hunter Lawrence just missed him, but Joe Shimoda did not miss him as uh, Freezy tried to stand back up and then got clocked on the side of the helmet with uh, Shimoda's fork. And then his foot peg also got Freeze in the back of the helmet, so a double whammy on that. Liat helmet, which uh, good good advertisement for them to uh, show off how good those helmets can take a hit and keep on ticking, I guess. But um, yeah, Freeze didn't finish the race, and it was because apparently he bit his tongue. I didn't know this, but I think that that is why you saw him frantically trying to get his helmet off. I don't know if he's bleeding or if he just, you know, you people who've bitten their tongue before know that that feeling sucks. Like it's just like a shock, and uh, especially if you actually, you know, cut it from biting it. Uh, that's not going to feel too good. So I, I guess that's why he was a little bit woozy off the side of the track. I do actually think that he probably had a little bit more than that going on, but um, I, I'm sure he'll be okay moving forward. It just, you know, a bummer for him because he was so close to a podium right there and then uh, ends up not even finishing the race. So Lawrence went by, got into third, finished third. Shimoda went down, almost saved it, almost saved it. And uh, would have been a hell of a save if he was able to, because he, basically ran over Freeze's head and then kicked right really hard and almost pulled it back before he got into the tough blocks, but hit the tough blocks, uh, stalled the bike, and it's kind of all she wrote for him. He went back to seventh, stayed in seventh, finished seventh, and it's just been a weird year for Joe Shimoda this year. Nothing seems like it's clicking. Even right there when he's catching those guys and maybe looking like he might sneak onto the podium late, just gets caught up in the, kind of the melee, and lo and behold, he ends up seventh on the night. So, yeah, kind of weird night for him. 
And uh, yeah, the rest of the 250 class is kind of up and down. Unfortunately, you know, I had Garrett Marchbanks on my fantasy team, so him not making the main was a little bit of a disappointment. I'm sure for him it was way more of a disappointment than it was for any of us that had him on our fantasy teams, though, because um, that's not a good look. Even though he had a terrible gate pick in the LCQ after DNFing the heat race to start, I think he was like sixth and then crashed on the first lap. And then he got up to Devin Harriman four fifth right at the end, which wasn't going to be for a transfer spot, but he couldn't get around Harriman either. Just not a good look. And then after the race, Marchbanks pulled off the side of the track and just put his head into his handlebars for like 20 seconds. And you could just tell that it's just like, I mean, that's the last thing that you want to happen right there for him is, uh, you know, he, he almost podiumed at Anaheim one, literally on the fringe of just getting on the box and being right in the mix of this title hunt from the first round onward. And now we're here at round four and he, he's not even making the main event. So weird turnaround for him. Um, I saw some people commenting that w I didn't give any updates on stank dog. Uh, yeah. Jared stanky went down really hard. I think it was in the LCQ. Yeah, yeah, LCQ. He tucked the front wheel coming into the berm after, or right before the finish line jump, I should say, and uh, like high sided over it and literally kind of gracefully through the top of the berm did a front flip. And he was down for a moment. I guess they never showed it on TV. I didn't know that. I thought that they did show him get up, but um, it looked like he knocked the wind out of him because an Alpine Stars guy went over there and he like kind of waved him off. And then took a minute to sit back up, but he was fine. Like he got back up, he got back on his bike. I think he finished the race actually. Uh, maybe he went and grabbed his mechanic and left, but he was fine. Uh, he didn't get hurt, uh, at least you know not enough to take him out of the next weekend. He'll be back for Glendale, I'm sure. Uh, There's just a freak deal. So um, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't update you guys on Jared Stanky's condition, but as far as I saw, everything was totally fine. He didn't look hurt to me. So. Um, but yeah, that's Stank Dog, um, and that's kind of my synopsis from Anaheim too. Hopefully you guys uh, enjoy that little bit more detailed explanation of everything that I saw. Of course, being there, um, I feel like I see maybe a little bit more of things that not everybody gets to see. Um, but it seems like TV broadcast was pretty good this week. I think you guys like Daniel Blair being in the booth. Uh, it's cool to see Zach Osborne. I ran into him in the pits on Friday, and he actually told me he was pretty nervous about the TV thing. So get off his back, people. Uh, even if he didn't do fantastic the first time out, I still think Zacho's insight with the sport is very good. He's actually one of the, you know, more well-spoken guys once you actually get him talking in this sport as well. And, uh, he likes this media thing too. Like he's, you know, done some guest editor stuff for racer X. He's done podcasts before. Like he's kind of into it a little bit more than some other people that they could pick to do that. So I think if he keeps at it, if he you know comes back these next couple weekends while DB's in the booth, I think Zacho's going to get better at it. So don't pick on Zacho, people. He's a good dude. Um, it was nice to run into him on Friday. He's doing very well. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing more moving forward. Uh, I will be in Glendale this weekend, so hope to see any of you out there in the old Phoenix area, kind of my old stomping grounds. I lived there for a little bit. But, uh, yeah, hope to see some of you guys this weekend. I am going to pick, I think... As ridiculous as this sounds, I do think Ken Roxon rebounds this weekend and wins the Triple Crown in Glendale. I just think he has to. I think there's no other option. And I think that the shorter race distances will probably help him. And the last time we had a Triple Crown race in Glendale, Kenny won it as well. Um, 250s. I got a bold prediction for 250s. I think Freezy wins a main event in the triple crown. I don't think he wins the overall, uh, but obviously the triple crown races, they are three main events towards an overall. And that's kind of the racing format. I think Freezy wins the first main or the second main or something like that. <sighs> I will go Lawrence this week for the win, just cause I, I, I like to stir it up a little bit, I think. But I also think that Lawrence is one of the few guys this year that like actually has shown consistency with his starts. Craig's been pretty good with the starts. I get it. But Lawrence, like, the progression has been noted. Like, he's been making the strides with the starts that have come around. He hasn't been happy with them, but they haven't been awful. They've been eighth or better every time. I'll probably regret it, but I think I'm going Kenny and Hunter Lawrence this weekend in Glendale. And I'm sure two different people will win. But that's why it's fun to talk about these races and figure out what the heck is going on in Monster Energy Supercross right now. As we head into round five this weekend in Glendale. So that's my synopsis of A2. 
preview going into Glendale. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, the usual if you haven't already. Uh, always love hanging out and talking with you guys in the comment section below. And I, I, I know I'm getting tantalizingly close to that 100K mark. I'm not the only person that's unaware of it or anything along those lines. I, I know, and I'm, I'm hoping we can get there potentially this year. It'd be awesome. But, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun doing these videos for you guys. And, uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed. So thanks for stopping by. And we'll see you guys in the next one. So long for now.